Welcome to Just a Minute. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it's my huge pleasure to welcome our many listeners, not only in this country, but around the world, but also to welcome to the programme four exciting, talented individuals who are going to play just a minute. And they are, seated on my right, Paul Merton and Jenny Eclair, and seated on my left, Graham Norton and Zoe Lyons. Please welcome all four of them. <laughs> and as usual, I'm going to ask them to speak on a subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition or deviation. Beside me sits Sarah Sharp, who's going to help me with a score. She will run the stopwatch for me, and she will blow a whistle when the 60 seconds have elapsed. And we begin the show with Paul Merton. Paul, opening night, something we've all experienced. Talk about it, if you can, starting now. Opening nights can be rather traumatic. I suppose it depends on the show that you're appearing in. Last Christmas, I was in the pantomime at Wimbledon Theatre, playing the part of Widow Twanky in Aladdin. And I remember the opening night particularly well, because when you're in a panto, things can run... <laughs> Jenny, challenge? Double panto. No, oh, pantomime sorry, first. there's an, another adjudicator on the front. <laughs> 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 She said no before Sarah could. <laughs> <laughs> it's extraordinary. No, it Apologies, Paul. No, Apologies, he said pantomime everybody. the first time and panto second. So, Jenny, an incorrect challenge. Yeah, Paul has a point, already. keeps the subject. And there are 44 seconds still available, starting now. Whereas my recent theatrical experience, which finished just the other day, was an improvised comedy performance featuring myself and four other people. And what a tremendous piece of fun it was. But no opening night nerves, because you don't really have time to be nervous. There isn't anything to worry about. The show doesn't exist. And so, for all intents and purposes, doing something where you're making it up when you go along is easier than something that you've loved or something <laughs> Ah. <laughs> Zoe, you challenge first. There were a couple of somethings there in there. Absolutely. there. Zoe, there are 17 seconds still available. <clears throat> opening night is a subject starting now. My most memorable opening night was when I was nine years old in my primary school. I was in a nativity play playing the marvellous part of the innkeeper's wife. Unfortunately, the innkeeper had got the day oh. to... <laughs> So, Graham, you challenge first. Did I um, hear a second innkeeper? No. <laughs> no, it was innkeeper so and innkeepers. In it was singular and plural. Oh, oh, oh. Which nobody Jim. else on the panel seems to have noticed, mm. but... Uh, <laughs> Why, it was curse innkeeper. you, Merton. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have got away with it if I'd not pesky Merton. He's absolutely <laughs> right, <laughs> though, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> it was innkeeper and innkeepers. That's right, it yes. was, apostrophe S. Yes. Right. yes. Give Graham a bonus point, cos yes. we are sorry for him. <laughs> Zoe, you have a point for an incorrect challenge. And you have five seconds on opening night, starting now. Unfortunately, Mary and the baby Jesus also didn't turn up on that occasion. <laughs> In this game, who am I speaking when the whistle goes, gains an extra point. And on this occasion, <laughs> it was Zoe Lyons. Right. Uh, Jenny Eclair, would you begin the next round? The subject we've got here is a beach holiday. I'm sure you've had many of them. Talk about one or all of them, if you can, in this game, starting now. Well, what a coincidence, because I recently returned from a beach holiday, a week with my trotters up on the Greek island of Skiathos. There I sat on a luxury lounger in my size 14 polka dot swimsuit with the <laughs> hidden tummy control panel <laughs> bursting at every seam. <laughs> Sipping lager, tiny voice in my head going, can you really afford this? Maybe you should go indoors and write several thousand words to justify your existence in this paradise. One goes on a beach. Oh, poor you challenge. Well, I thought it was a hesitation. I thought it was a hesitation too. I thought it was a breath, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. So, Paul, you have a correct challenge. The point, of course... 21 seconds are still available, starting now. I was 10 years old. Great Yarmouth was ahead of me. As I stepped off the train, I realised that this beach holiday was going to be the best holiday in my young life. Zoe Chan. Sorry, that's deviation. I've been to Great Yarmouth. <laughs> It not was, 50 it was not... years ago, it was great 50 years ago, it was yeah. lovely. But I'm, I'm not going to give it against you, because otherwise I'm going to get all those letters from people in Great Yarmouth. 
<laughs> telling me how wonderful the place is. So, Paul, another point to you. Ten seconds, a beach holiday is starting now. The donkey derby caught my attention. Each one of the donkeys was lined up next to the one next to her. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you tried so hard to get out of it. Yeah, right. I did, you. Yeah. And Jenny got in first with three seconds to go Ooh. on a beach holiday starting now. God, I love the sand, sea and sun. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of that round, Paul Merton and Zoe Lyons are equal in the lead, ahead of Jenny Clare and then Graham Norton. Zoe, we'd like you to begin the next round. The subject is painting and decorating, <clears> starting <throat> now. My greatest skill is not painting and decorating. <laughs> Don't... Graham, you challenged. There was a slight hesitation. There was a slight hesitation. Oh, that was just me gearing up. I was, I was doing the prep before the painting and decorating. That's what you've got to do. I was merely masking up my mouth. I know, Dad, but when I say the next person to speak is Zoe Lyons, mm. that's when you take the breath in, ready to go, when I say starting now. See, I've got quite big lungs, Nicholas, so it takes me longer to fill them. So that's but what darling, happened there. That gesture you're making is not a very... Sorry, elevator. that's... <laughs> Uh, uh, Graham, a correct challenge. You have painting and decorating as a subject, and there are 58 seconds available <laughs> starting now. Give me a cushion, I will scatter it. Give me a rug, I will oh, throw it. Oh, Zoe, yes. You've got it back on your I, I see what I did there. <laughs> Give me back the subject. <laughs> and you've got it back. <laughs> painting and decorating is back with you, Zoe, and 54 seconds available. Starting now. I once tried to replace a rail in the bathroom and did such a bad job of it, we had to redecorate the entire room, which cost way over £2,000, which was way more than the actual... Oh. <laughs> Graham, you got in first. Uh, a repetition of way. Yes, there was too much way there. 45 seconds still available. Graham, painting and decorating starting now. I was a star pupil in woodwork. Yes, I really was. Back home, my mother has a lovely stool covered with plastic... Paul Chance. So this is woodwork? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not painting and decorating? But it is, because I'm making things to decorate my beautiful home. But, but... My mother's house wouldn't look the same without that stool. <laughs> Did you Graham, paint you, it, Graham, Graham, you didn't you... Yes, I did. <laughs> with varnish. Mm. <laughs> you didn't establish that. Didn't you I? You went on about uh, making this stool and How everything. How long was I talking for? I didn't <laughs> establish that. 18 seconds. Oh, well, that's, that's quite a long time, in fact. Yeah, right. yes. So, Paul, a correct challenge. And there are 38 seconds still available. Painting and decorating starting now. The hardest paint to mix is striped. And so if you get very lucky, you get hold of some black and some white and put it all together in... Do you need challenge? Some. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Too many sums, yeah. right. Correct challenge, 30 seconds still available. Painting and decorating starting now. I would like to design a range of paints based on my mood. Maybe furious tangerine temper, sulky blue, bored grey, invisible middle-aged me. <laughs> I would paint my house... Paul challenge. Invisible paint, is that a good idea? It's <laughs> same as striped, in the same way that you had striped, I've got invisible paint. <laughs> <laughs> like tartan paint, which mm. was going to be my next one. Oh. <laughs> Off you go, then, don't let so me stop So, Jenny, the benefit of the doubt to you, Jenny, and you've still got painting and decorating, and 13 seconds starting now. Of course, the thing with painting and decorating is you must prepare first, otherwise... <coughs> Paul Challenge. Well, deviation, you said your next one was going to be tartan paint. <laughs> and you didn't mention tartan paint, you went on to preparation for paint and decorating. I was going to rub down and then I was going to tartan paint it up. <laughs> so you were going to do something else before you mentioned the tartan paint? Is that paint? deviation? Mm. Yeah. Oh, God. Uh... <laughs> Well, in a way, Paul, she just started off on a different tack. Yeah, yeah that's, she, that's she's true. She's still enough. on the subject of painting and decorating. Sure. So um, mm -hmm. I, I would be very harsh if I give it against her. Mm -hmm. She has the benefit of the doubt. And seven seconds still available for you. Painting and decorating starting now. The hardest painting and decorating <coughs> job. Uh, oh, Graham Challenge. Repetition of hardest? Yes, you've talked about the hardest before. Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> this game I could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> gets increasingly difficult as one gets older. <laughs> I have no idea what I've said. <laughs> anyway, Graham, you've got him with five seconds to go on painting and decorating, starting now. Sanding it down is very important. I remember that as a child. They would... Mm. <laughs> so Graham Norton was then speaking as the whistle went, gained the next point, and Graham Norton, we're with you to begin the next round. Back in my day... 
60 seconds if you need it, starting now. Back in my day, I probably wouldn't have been given this subject because I was young. Now that I'm a craggy, grey-haired, baggy-eyed old man, it's quite fitting. Uh, Jenny Challenge. Deviation, you've always been baggy-eyed. <laughs> I've grown into them. <laughs> <laughs> now they're age appropriate. That's true. Uh, Jenny, if you'd said that's not true, out of kindness to Graham, I would not have allowed it. But you've just been rude, weren't you? Get, <laughs> uh, give I'm quite a, and factual. Rude and factual. Uh, yeah. But affectionately rude. Yes, but we'll give you a bonus point because we enjoyed the interruption. <laughs> so, Graham, you've still got the subject and a point because you were interrupted. Back in my day, starting now. Back in my day, I had energy to burn, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, the candle could be burnt at both. Oh, Zoe, oh, no, no, sorry, I was trigger happy. Yeah. I was trigger happy. It was burnt, yeah. and burnt and burnt. Burnt and burnt, yes. Yeah, it was really skillful of me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I do feel I was... It was slowing a bit there, wasn't it? The candle yeah. was so starting to get going there a bit. So, Graham, another point to you. 43 seconds still available. Back in my day, starting now. Back in my day, cinema was my passion. I would love going to see the movies, or the moving pictures, as we called them, back in my day. They were black and white, and my mother would play the piano in front of the screen to entertain us, because there was no sound. Back in my day, we loved that sort of thing. Back in my day, we ate bread, because potatoes were scarce. So... It was the famine, of course. You will call that from your history books. <laughs> back in oh, my oh, day. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Sorry. There, quite a long there way was back. before that beautiful soliloquy. There was a bit of a hesitation there. I thought. I didn't there notice was... any hesitation. He kept going and going. Oh, did you? It was, uh, it was just a back, sure? back in my day. Seemed to get longer and longer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think he gets the benefit of the doubt. OK, I So he gets a point for an incorrect challenge. <laughs> 20 seconds still available, um, Graham. Wait, wait, let's just establish how many seconds left? 20. Wow, oh, God. <laughs> OK, let's do it. OK. <laughs> 20 seconds. Huh? It's amazing how long a minute is until you play this game. Right. <laughs> so, 20 seconds, Graham. See if you can keep going and back in my day, starting now. Back in my day, I started talking about this, and that was a very long time ago. I can't quite recall the things I have previously said about back in my day, so now I have to be rather careful and circumspect about the topic of which I am. Oh, oh Jenny, you challenged me. Uh, just drying up, he was hesitating. And yes, I'm Breaking down you did. really mentally. <laughs> really. And unfortunately, you, you paused with two seconds to go. <laughs> In my day, that wouldn't have been allowed. <laughs> so, Jenny, two seconds you've got. <laughs> Back in my day, day, starting now. Back in my day, oh. Top of the Pops was... Yeah. The... <laughs> so, Jenny, Claire was then speaking as a whistle wind, gained a point for that, and she's increased her lead at the end of the round. And um, Paul Merton, we're back with you to begin. Ah, a lovely subject. Louis Armstrong. Tell us something about that great musician and talent, starting now. Well, he has the claim to be one of the most influential musicians of the 20th century. Before Louis Armstrong started playing solo trumpet, jazz bands tended to be like marching groups, where each instrument was playing the same refrain over and many times again. <laughs> so Louis Armstrong broke away from that. His great hero was a fellow trumpeter called King Oliver, and Louis followed him to New York, where he started to play in the clubs there, and soon people were absolutely absolutely enchanted by what he was doing. If you listen to a track called Potato Head Blues, made around about 1932, I think, you can hear the superb Louis Armstrong musicianship coming back to you through all those decades and feeling as fresh as if it had been recorded yesterday. Louis Armstrong is remembered for many songs, particularly things like Hello, Dolly, and that was a great hit for him in the 1960s. But it's as a pioneer of syncopated music that he should be remembered. <laughs> Well, Paul, that was most impressive and very interesting as well. He was speaking as a whistle wind, gained a point for that, and you also get a point for not being interrupted and keeping going, but you're still in third place. <laughs> <laughs> Out in the lead, Jenny Eclair and Graham Norton, but they're two points ahead only of Paul and three or four more of Zoe Lyons. Uh, Jenny, your turn to begin. 
What a contrast. From Louis Armstrong, we go to fish and chips. <laughs> that is the subject, Jenny. 60 seconds if you need it, starting now. Fish and chips is one of my favourite meals, best eaten in a seaside resort where the catch is local and fresh. Big cod in batter, flabby chips, mmm, and mushy peas. Let's get some colour in there. Other options might be pan-fried salmon with zucchini chips. That's mm. very modern. Or you might go for grilled calamari with sweet potato wedges. Variations on the fish and chip. Graham challenge. I would call that a deviation. Well. <laughs> If somebody said, come over for fish and chips, and they got me calamari and sweet potato <laughs> fries... <laughs> I... Well... No! Yes! No! <laughs> no! I... I love no. it... No! <laughs> Jenny, can, I... you, can you justify it? Well, it, uh, it is... We are talking about a, a, a creature from the sea which That is isn't a fish! <laughs> uh, do you know what? I'm not quite sure. What the hell are they? <laughs> They're yes. very... It is. I'm talking about octopus, aren't I? Is yeah. calamar, am I right? Yes. Yes. Squid. Baby squid, baby okay. squid. OK, it's squid. not a fish, is it? What Cephalope have I done? Is it a mammal? Cecloped. A thingy... A cecloped... I don't want yeah. you interrupting Sorry. now. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you know. But I would say it is from the sea. I uh, knew this was going to be a controversial subject. <laughs> <laughs> I think I should be given the benefit of the doubt, but maybe Graham should be given a point for interrupting and being quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> and baggy eyes. Exactly We're not forgetting it. We're not forgetting it. Baggy I would do exactly as Jenny suggested. She gets the benefit of the doubt, she keeps the subject and a point, and Graham gets one because he enjoyed his interruption. All right, everybody's happy now, I hope. <laughs> I'm not happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy. Jenny's happy. Yeah, I'm right. fine, for the time being. So, Jenny, we're still with you on Fish and Chips. 28 seconds available, starting now. Back in my day, all the teenagers used to congregate around the chippy and boys would throw chips at the girls they fancied. How <laughs> I longed to have some potato thrown in my face, <laughs> even if it had vinegar that went in my eye, but most... Uh, poor challenge. Was it repetition of thrown? Throw a thrown. Throw and oh, throw. Oh, throw and throw, mm. is it? Mm. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. mm. <laughs> Jenny, incorrect challenge. Another point to you. Nine seconds available. Fish and chips, starting now. I like them wrapped in newspaper, which is illegal now. Do you remember eating fish and chips off the Prime Minister's face? <laughs> so, Jenny Clare, speaking as the whistle went, gained an extra point and has increased her lead at the end of the round. And Zoe Lyons, we're with you to begin. And the subject now is game shows. 60 seconds if you need it, starting now. Surely the greatest game show of all time was Sale of the Century. Oh. <laughs> and in what can only be described as Britain's version of Las Vegas, Norwich, and hosted by our very own Nicholas Parsons. Oh. It was a tremendous game show where contestants would answer questions in order to earn money with which they could buy top-end tat. <laughs> My next favourite game show was the uh, Generation Game... Oh. Paul, you challenge first. Hesitation, sadly. I'm afraid, yes, I was enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> Nice to get a mention, isn't it, Nicholas? <laughs> yeah. Just for younger listeners, which century was it? <laughs> Just for younger listeners. Paul, Paul, that was the title of the show. Oh, was it? The Sale of the Century. Oh, was it, really? But it was in this century. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Oh, no, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so old, I forget. It was the last one. <laughs> Paul, you had a correct challenge. Mm. And there are 31 seconds for you to tell us something about game shows starting now. One of the biggest game shows on American television is mm. called Jeopardy, and there's a gentleman who's been on that show who has been winning for the last three or four weeks. I believe he's just been knocked out, but he has created a record which has been standing for some 28 years, which he has broken for the number of questions that he has... Graham challenge. Repetition of broken. The record is broken, and then you ah, just said... Ah, yes, broken. you're quite right, yeah. Graham. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> and you have game shows. And 14 seconds, starting now. Daytime television is a cornucopia of game shows, and some of them are remarkable. There's that one that has the little <coughs> pennies. A Jenny challenge. That one that has that, that. It was a bit petty. Oh. Yeah, I take it back, I take it back, I take it back. <laughs> I want I'll, to take it back. I'll just cry my baggy eyes out. <laughs> 
would like to prostate myself on... You like to do what? <laughs> <laughs> I've got, Aren't I've you got... being paid enough to do the gig? Mm. <laughs> uh, Jenny, I, I admire your acuity in being so quick, but uh, I also admire your generosity in giving it back. I would like to give, give it, it a back. little bit, yes. And so Graham gets the point. Five seconds of Graham for you on game shows starting now. Tipping point. It's just come to me. I'm so glad I was able to wait and remember that word. <laughs> so Graham Norton was then speaking as the whistle went, gained an extra point, and uh, we're with you, Graham, to begin. Oh! And the subject we've got here is box sets. 60 seconds if you want it, starting now. I do love a box set to the point where often the streaming service I use will say, are you still watching this? <laughs> Which is like your television saying, you okay, hon? <laughs> Loved by the thing that is providing the programmes which I watch in a series, one after another. Paul Challenge. Do you have a repetition of watch? Probably. Oh, yes, indeed. Well, listen, Paul, a correct challenge. Box sets with you. 40 seconds available, starting now. People do binge on box sets these days, don't they? They take the time off work and sit down in front of the television and watch all 155 remaining episodes of Sale of the Century. <laughs> Fantastic programme that was. I'll have the bicycle for five pounds and they'd get it. And then I would think to myself, if only I had enough time in my life to watch every single box set. Think of 24, that first series starring Kiefer Sutherland many years ago. That pioneered the idea of the continuing narrative story taking place over many episodes. <laughs> I'm... Zoe Challenge. I think I heard too many. I don't know, nobody else did. Some... <laughs> I'm sure I stopped I, listening I'm sure ages ago. I don't remember if you did say many because you were going at such a pace. Um, what's that? Did anybody else hear I too don't many? Know. <laughs> I I'm going to give the yeah. best. Oh, somebody else heard too many. There were too many. You had confirmation too... from the audience. Yeah. yeah. Well, wait well, a minute. Mm -hmm. Is this going to be a scientific poll or what? <laughs> <laughs> we know the dangers of asking mm. people how they'd like to vote, but nevertheless. Yes. <laughs> Simply taking back control, Paul. That's mm. all I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> no, Zoe, you did have a great chance. And you have eight seconds still available on box sets starting now. My niece asked her to buy me box sets for Christmas, and I don't really like box sets at all. So, in the end, what they actually did was just buy me... Mm. <laughs> well, <laughs> Zoe Lyons, speaking as a whistle when she's moved forward. She's sitting in fourth place, but she's yeah. moved forward. <laughs> And Paul Merton, it's your turn to begin. And the subject now is hobbies. Tell hobbies. us something about oh. hobbies. That's the subject, starting now. Hobbies are a great way to pass the time, aren't they? I remember when I was 13 years old, I started to collect standard eight films, home movies, Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, Lauren Hardy. These were the stars that I had in my repertoire collection. And I would... Oh. <laughs> uh, Jenny Challenge. His hesitation. No, there's no hesitation. Well, he stopped talking. He went, oh, yes. like that. His deviation from the subject. He just stopped. Didn't you, Paul? No. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh he was smooth tongued fibber. I thought he was he... going with great patience. Yes, yeah, so did I, actually. Mm. Oh, <laughs> you can't do How that. How dare you call me that? <laughs> <laughs> he so... really did stop talking and he went, oh. All right, Jenny, you've convinced me. <laughs> 44 seconds for you on hobbies starting now. I'm so excited to talk about my hobbies on radio, for I have many. Yoga, 15 minutes every morning. Painting, the only thing that makes my blood pressure drop. I sit there with all my materials over the kitchen table and I am the happiest I have ever been. Knitting is another of my hobbies. It's so great being middle-aged. Hobbies are wasted on the young. All they think about is snogging in parks. But can I just say right now, the perks of being in your 50s mean you can take up any kind of craft that... Graham Challenge. In their 50s? <laughs> Oi. Oi, baggy eyes. <laughs> I've got about eight forgotten. months left. I've got eight months left until I get my card, my bus I card. I don't know what I'm going to do with the Graham. They enjoyed your interruption so much. 
We're going to give you a bonus point for that. Thank you very much. But Jenny was interrupted. She wasn't committing any of the sins of just a minute, and she still has hobbies. And five <laughs> seconds to go, starting now. I am also a very keen disco dancer and hula hooper. <laughs> and uh, so we're moving into the final round. Uh, I'll give you the situation as we do. Zoe Lyons has plays with great aplomb. She's still in fourth place, but she's only just behind Paul Merton, who's two or three points behind Graham Norton, and he's one point behind Jenny Eclair, who's in the lead as we go into the final round. Ooh! And Jenny, it's your turn to begin, and the subject is hen parties. <laughs> 60 seconds starting now. Do you know what? I'm actually quite scared of hen parties. When you're on a high-speed intercity train and a load of women get on, start popping Prosecco at 9.30 in the morning, <laughs> and you think, oh, this is going to mean shrieking. And then they get out loads of willy-shaped novelty items. <laughs> and apparently this is hilarious. Well, I'm sorry, I've no sense of humour left. I'm not a hen party type of girl. Don't really like fun. When I got married two years ago, I had a nice early night, so I was fresh on my bridal day. In the old days, they were simple occasions, but and they got complicated. These days, I was on a flight to Prague once. Whole <coughs> hen... Paul Challenge. Did we have a repetition of days? Probably. Mm, yes, yes, you did indeed, as well as a hesitation. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul, you got here with 19 seconds to go on hen parties, starting now. As I stood alone, facing the firing squad, I saw in the window behind me, as I turned, Nicholas Parsons. He'd been on a hen night with all the other women that in the barracks, and he had taken them to the town and shown them what Cairo can be like at midnight. <laughs> they were enthused, enthusiastic, but more or less... So Paul Merton brought the show to an end with a great aplomb there and give you the final score. It's the same as when we started that round, actually. It's always important, eh? <laughs> then Paul Merton, and then Graham Norton, only one point ahead of Paul, but Jenny Eclair is one point ahead of Graham Norton, so we say, Jenny, you are our winner this week. <laughs> we do hope you've enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute, and we want to tune in again. Only remains for me to say thank you to these four delightful players of the game, Paul Merton, Jenny Eclair, Zoe Lyons, and Graham Norton. I thank Sarah Sharp, who's helped me keep the score, run the stopwatch, blown her whistle so elegantly. We thank our producer, who is Matt Strong. We're indebted to Ian Messiter, who created this amazing game. So from our audience here, and from me, Nicholas Parsons, and the team, thank you, and tune in when we play Just a Minute! <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. Hello. My name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it's my huge pleasure to welcome our many listeners, not only in this country, but around the world, and to welcome to the programme four exciting, dynamic personalities who are going to play Just a Minute and they are, seated on my right, Paul Merton and Sheila Hancock. And seated on my left, Tony Hawks and Phil Wang. Please welcome all four of them. <laughs> Beside me is it's Sarah Sharp, who's going to help me with the score. She'll run the stopwatch for me and blow the whistle when the 60 seconds have elapsed. And as usual, I'm going to ask them to speak if they can on a subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation or repetition or deviation. And we begin the show this week with Paul, and the subject is Practice Makes Perfect. Can you tell us something on that subject in this game, starting now? I'm not sure I entirely agree with the phrase that practice makes perfect. Certainly, practice makes better, but perfection is something that's very hard to achieve. If you look, for example, at the game of just a minute, you can say that if somebody speaks for the full 60 seconds, that is, in some ways, perfect. But I don't know that it is, because it depends on the content and how regular the other players are. I don't mean by how often... No, Dutch, I can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, you spotted uh, it. Slight hesitation. Yes, self-censorship. Yes. And uh, <laughs> also repetition of how. So, yes. Tony, a correct challenge. You get a point for that. And you take over the subject. 
and there are 36 seconds available. Practice makes perfect. Practice so. makes perfect and usually involves lots of repetitions in order to reach that state. And we're not allowed to do that, of course, on this programme, which is why we're all so rubbish at it. <laughs> Although maybe not, maybe... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, challenge. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so much your challenge. And Repetition of maybe. Yes, right. 20 seconds are still available, Paul. You have a point. You have practice makes perfect the subject starting now. In some professions, perfect is something you have to aim for. If you look at a tightrope walker crossing above the circus ring from A to B, he has to be or she... <laughs> Tony Challenge. I... Hello, you're oh. trying to make one up. Uh, no, I was going to do B, actually, but A to B and B, but the different, it was a different meaning of B the second time, so it was... I don't know what the hell you're talking about. No. <laughs> I realised I'd made an incorrect challenge. An incorrect challenge. I thought as well, because he, he corrected it, but I was going to say sexist, because he, yeah. he said he. Yeah, but but I then he corrected it, it himself. Mm. Totally. <laughs> but I got it in before you corrected it. Yeah. If my, if my buzz had gone through. Yes, but it no. didn't, so... It was cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> what can we do? <laughs> So, Sheena, I'm sorry you didn't get in there, but, Paul, an incorrect challenge. Another point to you. Nine seconds are still available. Practice makes perfect... As now. Jack Nicholas lined up the putt on the final green, the 18th, he rehearsed in his mind everything that he had practised before. He said to himself... <laughs> <laughs> In this game, whoever is speaking when the whistle goes gains an extra point. It was Paul Merton, and you won't be surprised to know that he's in the lead at the end of that round. <laughs> Sheila Hancock, will you begin the next round? I don't know whether this is some area in which you're involved, but we've got mountain climbing <laughs> starting now. Well, as it happens, this is something I know a great deal about, because a few years ago, I did a film about a woman who climbed a mountain, this one being Svilven in the north of Scotland, a beautiful place. And I decided that I was going to get into training, and I did three months in the gym. I did lots of walking, lots of jumping up and down, lots of hang, oh, oh, lots of, no. lots of, too many lots of. Mm -hmm. And Paul got in first. Yes, it was a, a, a lot of lots of. Lots, lots of, and lots, lots of. Lots of. 30 seconds are still available, Paul. You've got another point there. And uh, it's mountain climbing starting now. Mount Everest this year has seen a huge number of fatalities. It's become unbelievably busy at the top of that particular mountain. People are queuing up all the way back to base camp to experience the thrill of a lifetime, to say that they are better at climbing this mountain than other people before them. But... Uh, Phil Challenge. Being a repetition of people. Yes. Yes, indeed, there was, Phil. Well, listen. <laughs> You've come in with the first time, you've got a point, and you have the subject, mountain climbing. 20 seconds are available, starting now. Mountain climbing is something that I have done once in my native Malaysia. I climbed Mount Kinabalu. It was very high, and it took me a long time. It was difficult and exhausting and a wonderful experience, but I will never do it again. <laughs> I find... Oh, poor challenge. Well, it was a bit of a pause. It was. Wow. <laughs> Going. Now, you wouldn't want me to patronise Phil by not challenging. <laughs> <laughs> Can we be generous, Paul? It's Absolutely. Strong lead, right. But give him a point for a correct challenge to Paul, but leave it with Phil. Give okay. him a point now, because he was interrupted. All right. And you've got four seconds to go. Do keep going, irrespective, Phil. Irrespective of my ability to? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can take that into account on the way. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Mountain climbing starting now. Mountain climbing makes for very strong legs, especially if you do it often. <laughs> <laughs> so Phil Wang was then speaking with the whistle wind, gained that extra point, and uh, he's in second place now behind Paul Merton. And Phil, it's your turn to begin. Oh, fantastic. And, no, it isn't. It's <laughs> just the order of things. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How to make life magical. <laughs> Phil, the subject, a lovely one we've got here. Bath. Tell us something about bath in this game, starting now. Bath is a means of cleansing yourself, as well as a city in the West Country. This is an honour held only by Bath, also shower in Somerset, and fire hose Devon. <laughs> she had a challenge. Oh, it's a bit of a hesitation, but uh, again, let it go. Oh. <laughs> I think I might walk this. <laughs> 
<laughs> we can't have challenges and letting them go all the time. But I just instinctively did it, and then it was unkind, so I withdraw it. Oh. Well, if you want to withdraw... If it had been Tony, I would insist on it going through. <laughs> <laughs> and there are 40 seconds still for you, Phil, on oh. Bath, starting now. Bath was founded by the Romans, who created the Roman Empire. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, oh! I'm wrong again. Another point for Phil. It's good. I thought it was Roman, but it was Romans and Roman. Yes, I set a trap for you there, Tony. You and, did. Uh... <laughs> Which is rather cheeky of you as a first time. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. You've learned You're quickly. An incorrect challenge, actually, Phil. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So you have he another, gets another point. point. And you have uh, 44 seconds available. A bath starting now. I grew up in Bath for two years, which is to say, I didn't so much grow up in Bath. <laughs> ah. Tony Challenge. Uh, repetition of grow up. It was grew and then grow. Repetition of up. <laughs> Thank you. I think you have been rehearsing this at home. <laughs> I set a trap for you there, Tony. Uh, and I'm, it, it, I'm, I'm delighted grow. to be right. giving you the points. <laughs> Another point to Phil Wang, our first time player. And the 38 seconds still available for you, Phil, on Bath, starting now. In Bath is the Royal Circus, which is not so much a circus, but... Ah. <laughs> ah. Sheila. Repeat of circus. Yeah, we can't that one. circus the no. first time. <laughs> no, no, no. We're not going to play it anymore. you play the game now. We're not going to help you. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sheila, correct down. I point to you. 33 seconds available. Bath, starting now. I'm going to make a terrible confession. I don't like Jane Austen because I adore the Brontes. Therefore, when I go to Bath, I think this is where she set all her boring plays and books about people getting married and... Paul Jones. Did Jane Austen write plays? I don't think she did. No, well, they were adapted into plays. Yes. Yeah, but so she, you didn't so she say didn't that. Just write them, no, no, she didn't you write them. You said she wrote plays. She maybe did. They probably did it in, you know, sort of... I think, as far as we know, she didn't. So I have it's to use the, the benefit of the doubt. Hmm, Amateur dramatics, they did all the time in Bath. <laughs> but but she, she, she didn't write any plays, though? No. No. <laughs> Paul, you have the subject. And you have uh, 19 seconds. Bath, starting now. As I crawled into the bath, I realised that the English Channel was an extremely wide body of water, but my charitable attempts to cross it in a bath were not to be thwarted. My main navigator was Nicholas Parsons. He was wearing a striped blazer, a French beret. He was ready for the crossing. I knew I could trust him. <laughs> so Paul Merton, speaking as a whistle wind, gained that extra point, and he's increased his lead. He's two ahead of Phil Wang, and more than that, ahead of Sheila and Tony. And Tony Hawks, we're with you to begin. The subject, my record collection. 60 seconds, if you want it, starting now. I have started to collect one record after another. My proudest one of these recently, this is true, I was admitted to the Guinness Book of Records for furthest distance covered hitching with a fridge. That is quite magnificent, I believe. The only thing I've done as close to being as impressive as that is nearly talking for a minute on this show 20 years ago. <laughs> and I sense it's going to happen now. I can feel it in the room. I, like a lot of people, regret getting rid of my vinyl record collection. I used to have it. Oh, oh sorry. Um, Sheila Challenge. I thought it was a hesitation, yeah, but it kind of went I off, think was it? I think it was a hesitation. I don't think it was. No. And neither does Sheila anymore. But you, did a, <laughs> you did a magnificent gesture there, and gestures don't come over very well on radio, and so that meant you didn't speak while you were doing <laughs> I should like explain a... to our listeners <laughs> that Tony Hawkes, as he disagreed with me, has put his index finger up <laughs> a straight line at me. I can double that. <laughs> <laughs> Two is even worse. Isn't it? <laughs> The respect they have for their chairman is yeah. unbelievable. Is. <laughs> right. So, Sheila, you had a correct challenge. My record collection, 22 seconds, starting now. I do, in fact, have a lot of vinyl records, partly because my husband used to collect jazz, and I have an original white Beatles, which is valuable nowadays. Lots of lovely memories in those beautiful envelopes that you get out and read the directions. And like... Tony Challenge. Slightly picky here, but they're not 
envelopes. Well, they're, they're sleeves. Envelope, they're they are sleeves. kind of like envelopes. Well, they're like an envelope. I think she was... They envelop the record. Yes, they do, yeah. Enve oh. <laughs> but they're not envelopes. <laughs> They are to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can uh, say that they are a, a type of envelope. Um, okay. Sheila, benefit of the doubt, you keep the subject, you get a point for an incorrect challenge, and there are three seconds available. My record collection starting now. Several of them I appear on because I did some musicals. Right. <laughs> so Sheila Hancock with points in that round has moved forward. She's one point behind Phil Wang and uh, three points behind um, Paul Mert, who's in the lead, and then Tony trailing, but contributing. Uh, <laughs> and being rude to the chairman as well, for which he gets no point. <laughs> Paul Merton, we're back with you to begin. The subject, train stations. 60 seconds if you need it, starting now. My favourite kind of train station, I think of rather romantically, is the train station that's in the middle of nowhere, a single track, countryside, either side of that particular rail that I was talking about. And often the train may not come for several hours. You check the timetable, you see there's one due at 10.25, but it's only half past eight now. And then when it comes to the time, you see the train... <coughs> uh, Tony Challenge. I think I might have done... I'm not having a good day today, because he said time twice, but once was timetable and the second was time. So I think that's, that's, right. that's wrong again, isn't Talked it? about timetable and time. I'm having a hell of an evening, Liz. <laughs> You'll get the hang of it, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do think he repeated... I see you fell from my trap. Yeah. <laughs> uh, incorrect challenge, Paul. 37 seconds still available. Train stations starting now. There was one train station right up in the north of Scotland that I visited for a Channel 4 documentary that I was making two or three years ago. Very remote, hostile landscape. You wouldn't think that a train would be appearing on that particular location and suddenly you hear a whistle in the distance. Then it starts to get nearer and closer and you think to yourself, ah, oh, there it is, the diesel train is coming towards me now. It will stop at this station. It will take me on to further destinations, great joys, will I end up seeing the pyramids of Cheops? No, more likely. <laughs> uh, Sheila, it's your turn to begin, and the subject now, a lovely one, the 60s. You have something you know about? Tell us something about it in this game, starting now. 60s, I lived through, but it kind of passed me by. I remember a story which I think I've told on just a minute before, but I'm so old, I've been here for 50 years. <laughs> but it was about Kenneth Williams and I being in a review, and I used to take him home to his flat in Paddington on my Lambretta, and we drove round. There was a big article in an American magazine saying that swinging London in the 60s was where it was happening happening and we drove around Piccadilly Circus and as we did Kenneth shouted out where are all these orgies why haven't we been asked <laughs> and it was true that the only people that came to those places oh Phil you've challenged as much as I want to hear the rest of that story um, I think there's a repetition of Kenneth Kenneth, probably. Yes, indeed, yeah. Yes. Was there? Yes. yes. I, I want, I, once I heard Orgy, I thought about not buzzing. But, <laughs> but I'm afraid them's the rules. Yeah. <laughs> Phil, you got in with 21 seconds to go. You tell us something about the 60s starting now. As the person here who is the youngest by quite some distance, I don't remember the 60s at all. Uh, I know <laughs> that... Paul challenge. It's hesitation. No, I don't think so. Yeah, he oh, said, ah. Uh. I said, ah. Uh. He actually said, ah. Uh. Oh. Oh, no, I was reminiscing. Ah. Oh. <laughs> well, you're not allowed to. You, ca All right. you well, can't reminisce good. about something you've just said didn't happen to you. <laughs> but you can hesitate. <laughs> I'll give you a bonus point for your response there. OK. For your R. But Paul... What? You give him a bonus point? <laughs> When he, he I mean, got out of the stop situation. Stop being kind to him. He's very wily. <laughs> <laughs> and he's the first time on the show. <laughs> uh, but Paul, you're correct. He did err. Uh, and there's 14 seconds available for you on the 60s, starting now. The 60s was an extraordinary decade. I once said to Willie Rushton, were the 60s particularly fantastic? He said, yes, but the 50s were so <laughs> awful. Tony Challenge. Two sets. Oh, yes, indeed. Well, oh, listen to I said to Willie Rushton, he said, I finally got one. Come on! 
Tony, you've got him with six seconds to go. And it's the subject of the 60s, starting now. The Beatles, Rolling Stones, what magnificent hippie years were there, flower... Paul Challenge. Well, all the 60s weren't hippie years, of course, because they was only in the sort of 67 Woodstock, 68, 69, so you couldn't say the 60s were hippie years. <laughs> Unless, of course, you read different history books to me. Paul, I think you could say they were a bit hippie. Yeah, they were a bit. I was around at the time. I know you were, yeah. They were, <laughs> they were more hippie in the 50s, but they were still beginning to be hippie then. Yes, absolutely. I don't think you were ever a hippie, were you, Nick? No, I was ever a hippie, no. A roundhead, yes, but not a hippie. <laughs> I tried I to measure up to your cavalier attitude. Indeed. <laughs> Give Nicholas Parsons a bonus Give point. Him a point. Yeah. <laughs> Tony, there's still one second on the 60s starting now. Shortly! <laughs> so Tony was speaking as a whistle went, gained the next point. It's all very close. He and Sheila are equal in third place, just behind Phil Wang. But Phil Wang is two or three points behind Paul Merton, who is our leader. But Phil, we're back with you to begin. A lovely subject now clowns. Tell us something about those eccentric characters starting now. Clowns are an interesting subject in that they are not at all. I uh, find that they are not entertaining nor fascinating and wonder how they have made it this long still with a job. Why do they wear all that makeup? What are they hiding? Who are they? Are they on the lam? Did they rob somewhere? Are they all criminals? Who knows what circuses are covering up? Which despicable members of this society are hiding in plain sight? Or be... Or, um, <laughs> I was reminiscing. Yeah. <laughs> but not very coherently. <laughs> Tony, you challenged uh, There was a hesitation. Yes, indeed. So you want clowns as a subject? 33 seconds available, starting now. I think clown schools have an unfair advantage because they don't have to do the national curriculum. <laughs> Maths and physics doesn't happen there at all. Just putting on those long shoes that fold up usually at the other end. Little red noses, this kind of stuff. How I long for a place where you study that kind of thing instead of the kind of stuff... <coughs> oh. <laughs> Phil challenge. Phil hesitation there. No hesitation at all. What? That's yeah. worth... No, just stupidity. <laughs> what would you call that? I That's just fine. call it keeping going with a okay. bit of rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I rescind my challenge and I am humbled. No, you don't be humble. <laughs> OK, I'll never be humble. You humbled. were playing the game very well. Don't, it's your first time. Yeah. You're good to have a, a go, and, but it was an incorrect challenge. Tony gets the point. Seven seconds still available. Clowns are starting now. The Tory party contenders for the lead <laughs> might be considered to be... So Tony Hawk was then speaking as the whistle went, gained an extra point, has moved forward. He's equal with Phil Wang. They're both just ahead of Sheila Hancock, and they're all trailing Paul Merton. But, Tony, it's your turn to begin, and the subject, another lovely one, honey. Tell us something about honey, something I adore. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, 60 seconds starting now. Do you have somebody to help you screw the lid off? <laughs> Why do you laugh at his rudaries? <laughs> I laugh at them as well, because they're funny. All right. H honey is the subject, Tony. 60 seconds starting now. Honey is something Nicholas absolutely adores. <laughs> I was very fond of the hit by ABBA in 1974, I think it was, Honey, Honey, I could give... I fell for it. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, no, they didn't have a hit for Honey, Honey. That, it was Money, Money, wasn't it? No, that was, was Money, honey, money, honey, Money. That's three repetitions. Did they, did they have a hit with Honey, Honey? I'll sing it for you if I get the subject back. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that one. Um, yeah, you can repeat the subject on the card. Yeah. yeah. And so, incorrect honey. challenge, Paul. A point to Tony. Honey, and 46 seconds available, starting now. Honey, honey, how you thrill me. Ah, uh -huh. honey, honey. Honey, honey, nearly kill me. Oh, ho. Paul challenge. Did you say this was a hit? <laughs> 
Well, when ABBA did it, it was a bit better than when I did it, <laughs> to be fair. But I wanted to prove that it was a song. Yeah. And the audience loved it. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, I have to take the audience's endorsement. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they didn't love it, but they approved of it, right? <laughs> 38 seconds still with you, Tony. Honey, starting now. Bobby Goldsborough had a hit with a song called Honey Also, which I will regale to you in my wonderful mellifluous, which is useful for that uh, subject we're talking about now, because it comes from Honey. Mel, I can't say it again, so I won't, but Mel was the singer... <laughs> <laughs> Paul Janice. Uh, sadly, repetition of Mel. Having Mel, yes. Trying yeah. to avoid mellifluous. Yeah. yeah. Mellifluous and Mel. So, honey's with you, Paul. There are 20 seconds still available, starting now. As I squeezed the bee into my egg cup, I could see that my supply of honey was getting higher and further closer to the edge. <laughs> I took the wasp that had then come in with the previous insect and I said to it, do you be able to provide... Well, do you be able? <laughs> <laughs> I suddenly challenge. become Cornish. <laughs> Do you be able? <laughs> Sheila, what was your challenge? It's honey? talking rubbish. It's oh. devi deviation. Deviation. So, Doing deviation from years. honey. So, a uh, correct challenge, Sheila. Uh, there are five seconds available. Honey, starting now. Honey, honey, kiss me was a song that Shirley Bassey sang, which I think is probably. <laughs> so, Sheila Hancock, speaking as a whistle away, gained the extra point. Let's move forward. So if we go into the final round, Paul Merton is in the lead. Uh, he's two ahead of Tony Hawks, and he's three or four ahead of Phil Wang, and the same with Sheena Hancock. So it's still anybody's game if you're interested in the points. And, Paul, it's your turn to begin. The subject, avocados. You either love them or, like me, don't love them. Oh. And that's 60 seconds, and you start now. Oh, I remember that Second World War song. Avocados, avocados, avocados. Tony Challenge. What Second World War song? <laughs> that, one. that was the, the B side to Honey Honey. <laughs> Deviation, Nicholas. He's making. He, you know, you remember that song during the war, Nicholas? Avocados. No. Sing it. What do you mean, no? There's no such <laughs> <that> song. <laughs> <laughs> I was around during the Second World War and no one was singing avocados. <laughs> Well, you, you said you didn't like them, so why would you be singing about them? <laughs> I wasn't singing about them, you yeah. were. Uh, I was. Yeah, out of tune as well. Yeah, well... <laughs> I didn't realise this was an audition. <laughs> Correct, challenge. Yeah. Tony, Avocados is with you. 54 seconds available, starting now. I lost my hammer, but I was able to use my Waitrose Ripen at Home avocado <laughs> to put the nail into the wall. <laughs> It was very successful, I don't mind telling you. I was told recently that avocados have the right kind of fat in them, which is a new thing for me, because I didn't know about that, but they're good for... Oh, uh, no, sorry, sorry. Why? I oh. thought he'd repeated himself, but he hadn't. He hasn't. No. So it was an interruption. He gets a point for that, keeps the subject. 27 seconds available, Tony. Avocados are starting now. Slice them down the middle, open them up, pop out the pip that's there waiting for you, and then put it in a salad with dressing. What a wonderful way to spend a fortnight of your life. <laughs> which I... Uh, Sheena Hancock, Channel. Have you not peeled it before you put it in a salad? You've popped the pip, which I question whether it's yeah, a pip. Just... It's more of a stone. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And you, <laughs> and you cut it in half. I do, or an envelope. Mm. Put, yeah. <laughs> now, Sheila, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> oh, golly. So, that was a very good interpretation there. And you've still got 12 seconds on avocados if you want it starting now. Well, as a vegan, avocados are a very important part of my diet. I have them crushed on non-gluten bread. It is not going to sound very appetising, and I don't think I'm going to... <laughs> so, Sheena Hancock, talking on avocados brought that show to the end. And I'll give you the final score. Uh, Phil Wang, who's never played it before, he finished in a very strong fourth place. <laughs> <laughs> and there you are, it was a very good one. Thank you. Thank you.
For a first-timer, he contributed very well, and he was only one point behind Sheila Hancock, and she was um, three points behind Paul Merton and Tony Hawkes, who were equal in the lead. Wow. So we say they uh, are our joint winners this week. We do hope you've enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute, and we'll tune in again when we take to the air and play this ridiculous, delightful game. It only remains for you to thank Sarah Sharp, who's helped me with the score. She's blown her whistle so well when the 60 seconds have elapsed. We're indebted to our producer, Alex Smith, and uh, to this lovely audience here in the Radio Theatre. So from the audience, for me, Nicholas Parsons, tune in again the next time we play Just a Minute! <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. And as the minute walls fades away, let me reveal that my name is not Nicholas Parsons. My name is Giles Brandreth, and this edition of Just a Minute is coming to you from the Edinburgh Fringe, where Nicholas has his own show, and last night was out on the razzle, got totally hammered, and is now in the cells at Leith Police Station cooling off. <laughs> Not so, not so. The truth is, Nicholas has been taking part in the celebrity naked attraction auditions, <laughs> got overexcited and slipped a disc. So I am sitting in for him, and I'm here to introduce the four unique personalities who are going to play just a minute today, displaying their skills with words and language as they try to speak on a subject that I give them for 60 seconds without hesitation, deviation, or repetition. Seated on my right are Paul Merton and Fred McCauley. Seated on my left are Lucy Porter and Ed Byrne. Please welcome all four of them. <laughs> Beside me is my carer, Sarah Sharp, who is going to keep the score and blow the whistle when each 60 seconds has elapsed. And we're going to begin with Paul Merton. And your first subject today, Paul, is the village fate. You have 60 seconds with the village fate starting now. As I looked across the village green at the village fete, I could see that it was festooned with bunting. Everybody was extremely excited to be attending that year's village fete. The cake stall was doing a roar in trade, as indeed was the line enclosure, which was a bit of a mistake because we found that we were losing quite a few of the customers during the course of that festivities. <laughs> Fred. I think that uh, constituted a hesitation. Festivities? The, well, there was a kind of interruption to the word festivities, I thought. You have to separate the words, otherwise it's... <laughs> <laughs> no, but I thought within uh, festivities. I, I think there was just a sort of... Oh, did you? Yeah. A statue yeah. of a... I, I yes. don't think there was, uh, to okay. be honest, because I'm new and Paul's been doing this a long time and I'm trying to be nice to him. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But I'm remembering we're in Edinburgh and Fred McCauley is a national treasure, so I think uh, Fred... What worst chairman we've ever had? <laughs> The benefit of the doubt, Fred, and you have 39 seconds left with the village fate starting now. I don't think it matters how many cake stalls there are. The important thing at a village fate is the beer tent. I've worked in a, such a place. <laughs> <laughs> Paul. A uh, slight hesitation. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely right, Paul. Yes. Well spotted. <laughs> Not as big as my hesitation, obviously, but nevertheless. A major hesitation, you're quite right. No benefit of the doubt, you're completely correct, mm. Paul. You get an extra point and 31 yeah. seconds to go on the village fate, starting now. As the flood waters grew higher, I started to worry about the fate of the village. Would it be there in the morning? The uppermost buildings, the church and the school, were just poking above the liquid that was pouring down from the heavens. And I thought to myself, the fate of this village is surely doomed. Uh, yes. yeah, that's a repetition Ed. of... Fate as a different word to fate in the title. Correct. Wow. F A T E repeated. Yeah. Well done, Ed Byrne. A newcomer to the show, but he clearly knows what he's doing. He's only got 14 seconds left, and he's scored a point, and you have 14 seconds with the village fate starting now, Ed. Very few people know that the origin of the village people was out of fate in Greenwich Village. Uh, where a policeman... <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Lucy has challenged you. Lucy, oh, what's your it, challenge? It's a lovely image I did of the err, village people, I? but you did err. Uh... Yeah. He, uh, he erred. It's human, but he did it. <laughs> <laughs> and I forgive him, because I'm divine. But <laughs> <laughs> you certainly are, and you're clever and crafty, too, because you've got only seven seconds with the village fake, Lucy, starting now. 
The village fate was originally devised as a way to get rid of coconuts that nobody wanted. Nobody's ever actually bought. Oh. 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 Repetition of nobody there at the end. No. Too late. Yeah. Yeah. Too late, Ed. You didn't Ooh. press the buzzer. No, I didn't. And the score at the end of that first round, quite exciting. The three guys have got one point, but Lucy's in the lead with two points. Congratulations, Lucy. Thank you. Fred. What? It's your turn. <laughs> it's your turn, Fred. Interesting subject here for a great professional like you. It's amateur dramatics. You have 60 seconds, Fred McCauley, with amateur dramatics starting now. Before I became a professional comedian, I did get involved once in my life in amateur dramatics. I took part in a pantomime in the village of Abbey Moor. The panto was called Humpty Dumpty. I played somebody who was in security, although also insecure. And I wasn't very good. And one night during the performance, I skipped forward eight. Lucy. I just felt there was a slight sort of hesitation. I was struggle. just slowing down. Yes, no. Okay, no, maybe, yeah. Uh, well, you know, uh, there certainly was deviation because I saw the show and he was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, security in Humpty Dumpty. He That's, was, yeah. You were piecing Humpty Dumpty. But you're Dumpty's. right, he was beginning to grind to a halt and it was noticeable. <laughs> Lucy, <laughs> I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. That's you pretty have... much the review I got in the Bad and Often Stars Piano. You have Lucy Porter, 36 seconds with amateur dramatics starting now. I too was involved in amateur dramatics once I was in a production of Shakespeare. I think it was Twelfth Night, which involves a cross-dressing plot. But something happened that surprised the audience, which was we had too many women, so most of the parts were played by females. So Andrew Aigcheek, Malvolio were all women. <laughs> oh. Ed Re Repetition of women. And I know what that feels like. <laughs> <laughs> Completely correct. There was a repetition and even a little bit of hesitation too. And mm -hmm. Ed Byrne, you've got him with just 16 seconds to go on Amateur Dramatics, Ed, starting now. Amateur Dramatics is an excellent way to get people out of the house and off the streets that would otherwise be annoying their partners and members of the public. <laughs> the only... Oh. Oh. <laughs> hesitation, was it, Paul? Yes, sadly. <laughs> it you was. You were nearly there, you were nearly there. <laughs> Paul, you're correct, you get a point there, and you've only got five seconds. Well done, Paul. Five seconds on Amateur Dramatics, starting now. As I turned towards the audience, I realised that my performance was going down the drain. Amateur... <laughs> <laughs> There's been a change at the top. Fred and Ed are in... Well, they're not at the top. At the top. <laughs> at the top, with the same number of points, we've got Paul and Lucy. Well done, you two. Neck and neck. OK, on we sweep now. Uh, repetition oh. of neck. <laughs> <laughs> You're liking this, aren't you? <laughs> yes, <laughs> little, little oh, job there, little No, that's no, good, good. <laughs> OK, Lucy, Lucy Porter, it's your go to start. Ooh, put on your skates, Lucy. The subject is Torville and Dean. You've got 60 seconds, starting now. Torville and Dean got together when Dean's last partner, Pearl, left him because the <laughs> advertising business they had was going downhill. He pa paired up with... Oh. Ooh. Yeah. Fred, you've challenged. Yeah, repetition of pair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pair, 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 pair. It was pair, 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 pair. I've got... so we're going to give Lucy a... That musical comeback was so brilliant, she yep. gets a bonus for that. Mm -hmm. But Fred, it was a legitimate challenge. Yeah, the, so... and the legitimate challenge was hesitation. Of course. Mm. And you have 49 seconds now, Fred, on the subject of Torville and Dean, starting now. Christopher Torville was a police officer before he went to the ice rink one day and thought, I must get myself a pair of skates and a one-piece lycra, which was pretty brave because it's cold out there. And he <laughs> took to the... <laughs> Paul's challenge. Sudden death. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hesitation. By which you do yep. mean hesitation. Yes, You're completely do, yeah. right. Another point for you, Paul. And you have 36 seconds with Torval and Dean starting now. The day I crossed Torval and Dean was one I shall never forget in my entire life. I'd made some sarcastic remark at them during the Olympics and they turned on me. As soon as they came off the ice, Torval grabbed me by the throat, Dean reached for my legs and they started to pull. As they stretched my body out, I could feel my stomach explode. Exploding. Torval and Dean, I said, I always knew you were a nasty couple, but now you are exhibiting your characteristics in a way which I couldn't possibly have predicted. Then I realised I was in the clutches of two potential murderers. They looked me straight in the eye. Dean punched me in the face. Torval smacked... Well, Lucy has challenged with only one second to go. Oh, no. oh, no. It better oh, be a good one. No. 
Oh. What is your challenge? Oh, God, I mean, I was just going to say deviation because they seem so nice. Yes, yeah. to you. <laughs> 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 to me, they were devils incarnate. <laughs> and possibly the BBC lawyers will be grateful to I you for thinking. putting the other side of the story in fairness, but it's not a no. valid challenge. No. So, Lucy, you don't get anything there. Yeah. And Paul does get a point, and he's got one second to go on Torvald and Dean starting now. Bolero! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> OK, a Scottish subject for you, Ed Byrne. Hmm? This is St Andrews. Tell us what you like about St Andrews, whether it's, well, whatever you want, about St Andrews in 60 seconds starting now. A quaint... So you... <laughs> Oh, oh, really? <laughs> Didn't even let me oh, get going. I, I, I'd like to give him the opportunity to start again. <laughs> Given that he has not Thank played you. this game before, Thanks. I think that's very generous Thank of you, Paul. Appreciate so it. you've only got 57 seconds, <laughs> Ed Byrne, on St Andrews starting now. A seaside village located on the northern coast of this venerable nation, St Andrews is known for many golf courses and overpriced tea shops. But it's best... <laughs> Paul, Fair enough. Challenge. there was a hesitation. There, was there a hesitation certainly there. was. You get a point, and you have 46 seconds with St Andrews starting now. <laughs> there was on the 15th green, about to putt, but who should come from behind the bunker but Torval and Dean? <laughs> they grabbed me by the throat. The other one's by the stoke, one up in the face, and I got kicked from here to all the way back to Basingstoke. Uh, <laughs> a challenge there from Ed. I think there was a hesitation on, but just before all the way to Absolutely. Basingstoke. There was. Absolutely. Well done, Ed. And you have 35 seconds with St Andrews starting now. St Andrews is home to the oldest and most venerable educational establishment in Scotland. Formed in 1974 as St Andrews Polytechnic, it became a university after... I, I paused because they were laughing. <laughs> That's not fair. That's but, not fair. I could understand yeah. why it would throw you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've, I've never had that at one of my shows before. <laughs> <laughs> Fred, what was your challenge? Uh, hesitation. There was. There but, was uh, a slight uh, hesitation. Ed called it a pause, and it's nice that you helped me out by telling me what you'd done. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no question of that. So, Fred McCauley, you get a point, and you get 24 seconds with the subject starting now at St Andrews. Go. As a Scot brought up in West Persia, namely Killin, we used to travel to St Andrews once a year for the Macaulay family holiday, leaving the village at 4.30 oh. in the morning. Oh. Ed has challenged and we think we know why. A little why. hesitation just yeah. before village there. Yeah. yeah, a major hesitation, yeah. Fred Macaulay. Well done, Ed Do Byrne. You, oh. you have mm. the final 13 seconds, or not, as the case may be. It's 13 seconds with you, Ed, starting now. As well as being the saint of Scotland, St Andrew is also the patron saint of Greece and women who would like to get pregnant and also gout and sore throats. <laughs> Unlike... <laughs> wow. Well, there we are. Ed Byrne was speaking as the whistle went. He gets an extra point. He's now moved into second place. Well done, him. We now move on to our next round. It's back with you, Paul, and the subject. Donald Duck. Tell us what you know about Donald Duck in 60 seconds. No rhyming slang, please. Starting <laughs> now. Well, I think it is rhyming slang for the current president of the United States of America. Also a cartoon character that I've always found particularly annoying in the past, that awful, irritating voice that he had. There was people at school who pretended that they could do an impression of Donald Duck, and it was very annoying, not the sort of thing you expect from the headmaster, but there he was, <laughs> every prize-giving day, doing his, what he thought, was approximately what Donald Duck sounded like. He is an extraordinarily nasty character. I've never winged for any of the Disney characters particularly. You've got Minnie Mouse and Mickey of the same variety. <laughs> then there's Pluto and Dumbo. Yes, Lucy. I thought Pluto. I felt there was a little hesitation oh, there. I don't know. Wow. Well, you, you, you missed the repetition of doing and character and oh, you go for this no. rather Annoying. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I Can I change a... my challenge? <laughs> uh, not now. It's too late, I'm afraid, so uh, you don't get the point there. Uh, repetition of character, then? No, too late. <laughs> <laughs> too late. Paul's got away with it and he has 26 seconds left with Donald Duck starting now. Pluto's main characteristic was to be a friend. Surely repetition of Pluto. Yeah, Pluto's. Pluto's. Oh, wow. Yeah. He's so good. Forgive yes, me. and it was characteristic yeah. this time, not character. Oh. I mean, I he's played this, character. He's played this before and you haven't. I think you are doing Jeez, brilliantly. I just thought I'd give it a go. Uh, yeah, and, <laughs> and my God, you are giving it a go, can I say? <laughs> wow. 
Now, Paul, you've got 23 seconds with Donald Duck starting now. 23 seconds with Donald Duck is probably more than I ever wanted in my entire life. But nevertheless, he had nephews called Huey, Louie and Dewey. And I remember reading about their exploits when I was a much younger version of the child you see in front of you now. Donald Duck doesn't wear underpants. I wonder why. Knowing had Duck's toilet habits, you'd think that somehow they would have some kind of protective undergarment. But, oh, no, that would be too much for Donald Duck. <laughs> Congratulations there to Paul Merton, who's consolidated his lead because he was speaking when the whistle went, did brilliantly with Donald Duck. OK, Lucy Porter, it's your go now. The subject is bugs. 60 seconds with bugs, starting now, Lucy. My favourite joke about bugs is, did you hear about the two bed bugs who met in a mattress? They're getting married in the spring. <laughs> the Pixar movie A Bug's Life is based on the story of the Seven Samurai, a Japanese movie. The original... Picture. Oh. <laughs> Ed Berners Challenge. I'm going to go with that's a hesitation just before sure. the word picture. Wow. You're completely right, Ed. Well done. You scored a point and you get the subject. It's bugs and it's 44 seconds for you starting now. Bugs is an excellent word because you can use it instead of insects when you want to say something like spiders when you mean general creepy crawly things, but somebody goes, oh no, they're arachnids because they're very irritating. I also agree that that film that you were talking about was an excellent one. It's also based on The Magnificent Seven, which was in turn based on the film you mentioned. Oh, uh, no. Yes, Paula's challenge. A uh, repetition of based on. Yes. Oh, yeah, mm. fair enough. Well done. Totally. The subject is bugs. You have 25 seconds with it, starting now. I had a bug infestation last year. It's a Giles Brandreth bug. It comes in through your window, won't stop talking, so you keep spraying it and it just falls back wearing its coat. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Fred, I'm very glad to hear this interruption. Yeah, yeah that was a, a that was long it. hesitation. Yeah. Yeah. It was, well, a, it was, it it was a, a deviation, it was a hesitation. It was a repetition of the insult it keeps leaving on my answer phone. <laughs> <laughs> So certainly you get a full mark there. <laughs> Hurrah! And you have 15 seconds with bugs starting now, Fred. Bugs is also the term used for little problems that you might have with your computer, the worst of which is a Trojan horse called Giles Brandreth, which comes into your computer. <laughs> top. Thank you, Ed. I'm very relieved to hear that you've interrupted. Repetition of the word computer. Yep. Oh, of course. Well done. Well, I've I... got two computers. <laughs> <laughs> OK, this is your big moment, Ed. Five seconds only with the subject now. It's Bugs. Bugs is also the title of the worst song Pearl Jam ever recorded on the Vitalogy album. <laughs> We're back to you, Fred McCauley. OK. And you've got a Scottish subject too. It's Loch Lomond. Tell us, Fred, what you know about Loch Lomond in 60 seconds, starting now. You're correct in the pronunciation of Loch... <sighs> Giles, because that's the way we do it in Scotland. It's a famous pool of water. Lucy has challenged. Hesitation before pool, I'm afraid. I think there was a slight mm. hesitation, given the lingering loch. We have to give you a hesitation there. <laughs> 51 seconds now, Lucy, with Loch Lomond starting now. Surprisingly, there is a nudist colony on Loch Lomond, and I once did a show there. They didn't pay me, I just did it for the exposure. But there are many <laughs> amazing things that you can see around Loch Lomond. Some of my friends got married on Loch Lomond in a beautiful hotel, which has now sadly burned down. I don't know why I said that. I'm bringing down the mood. Loch Lomond is... <laughs> Ed has... Repetition of down. Yep. Oh. Well oh. done. Ed is listening very sharply indeed. Ed Byrne gets another point and has 32 seconds with Loch Lomond starting now. There's a famous song about Loch Lomond, but in order to sing it correctly, I would have to repeat the word Bonnie, and that would mean someone would buzz in for that repetition. I, oh, but then I go and hesitate. <laughs> you were doing so well, but Paul has challenged you. It was hesitation, sadly. Yeah. No doubt at all. It was hesitation. 21 seconds, Paul, with Loch Lomond starting now. Kenny Lomond was one of the toughest criminals around. The cry went up, Loch Lomond up. But nobody could get hold of him. The police were baffled. St Inspector Stroll. <laughs> <laughs> Talking too quick. Ed. Talking too quick. Uh, a deviation for making up the word St Inspector. Yeah. <laughs> Special <laughs> branch. And I, I had a question that lock as well, because <clears throat> yeah. Ben explained to us that it's lock. Lock. It's so not yeah, lock. But is mispronunciation yeah. or something? Yeah. Like a grand but if I pronounced it that way, I would have got to the end of the, of the oh. minute. <laughs> well done, Ed Byrne. A legitimate challenge. You've just got ten seconds, Ed Byrne, on Loch Lomond starting now. Lately, there has been some controversy surrounding Loch Lomond because people have been camping there, which is something you're allowed to do all over this country, but because of littering... 
Well, Ed was speaking when the whistle went, and so it means he's nearly caught up with Paul Merton. He's wow. in second place. Lucy is in third place. Fred. Hello. He, yes. <laughs> There's some work to be done, Fred. The honour of Scotland. Uh, you know, you've got to do something here. Yeah? Sorry, it may be we'll be a nation on our own soon enough. It won't matter. <laughs> <laughs> A oh, nice, inclusive, welcoming remark there. Again. <laughs> OK, Ed, this is a subject for you. Mm -hmm. It's a password, a password. You have 60 seconds to tell us what you know about a password, starting now. When you are younger, a, pa a password... Oh. Ah. <laughs> just straight up... Just... All is challenge. I wonder what <laughs> and the challenge fair is. Fair enough. Carry on. Well, it was a hesitation. Yeah, it, it, it was a hesitation. There's no question. It was definitely a hesitation. But um, uh, let, him, let him start again. Oh. Let him start That's again. That's almost worse. The charity's I mean, almost worse. I, I... <laughs> so, yes, it's <clears> back <throat> to you, Ed, and we're going to give you 58 seconds now on a password. Go. Passwords seem exciting when you're younger. You can imagine you are a spy hacking into the mainframe of a shady... Organization, right? Oh, oh, oh. Look at that! That was a bomb right where you even buzzed. The, the audience basically buzzed me there. <laughs> Paul, tell us what your challenge is. Uh, it was a repetition of hesitation. <laughs> it was indeed. Well done, Paul. Another point to you, and you have 49 seconds with a password starting now. I was locked up in Spandau prison with, with Richard Hess. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Richard Hess. <laughs> Ed Burr. Can I just say, I'm going to let him continue. <laughs> okay. You get a it's bonus the for being such a gentleman <laughs> and a bonus for being so funny. And, Paul, you can indeed continue with really? another... Oh, yes, I mean, you've met your match here. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You were relieved to see me go. Now we found another one. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I, I'm, I can I tell you, I'm with you all the way. Absolutely <laughs> all the way on I've this. changed allegiances. Yeah. When, <laughs> when I wink, just buzz, OK? <laughs> okay? I think this is called grooming, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Paul Merton, you've got 45 seconds with a password starting now. I decided to pick a password that nobody else would guess, so I can't really tell you what it is, because otherwise I'd be breaking my own security. But passwords are very important for people who have computers. I don't own such a machine, but I imagine if I did, I would come up with some kind of password that would be incredibly difficult to guess. Something like Rumpelstiltskin, perhaps, but then if you do choose that as a password, you've got to be very careful that you do spell it right, because some people say to themselves, well, I'm going to pick the name of my favourite dog, or perhaps my mother's surname name when she before she was born well that would be difficult but anyway i would decide that i would use in the end no greater name than comes to me than winston uh, ah i'm gonna go for a repetition of name oh yes correct yeah. well done yes. Ed Byrne. repetition of name <laughs> you have seven seconds ed burn the subject is back with you <laughs> it's a password and may i simply say good luck <laughs> ed burn a password starting now those games that are played on the internet where they suggest you think of your Tory name by the place where you grew up and your... Well, there's been the most extraordinary turnaround. Fred McCauley is no. still in fourth place. Oh. <laughs> so it's not that extraordinary. Lucy yeah. Porter is still in third place. But after that tremendous round, guess who's <laughs> moved into the lead? It's Ed Byrne. I can't... Hooray! Responsibility. <laughs> Paul Merton, we're back with you, and you have this subject, my favourite lunchbox. You've got 60 seconds with that starting now. My favourite lunchbox was undoubtedly the one I took to school on a Monday. As I opened the Tupperware lid and allowed the air inside to escape, I could see the tuna sandwich lying within. That was one of my favourite meals of the day, to have that lunchbox in front of me. As I was then 12 years old, I picked up the aforementioned bread and stuffed it in my mouth. What a joy it was to feel the glorious fish slipping down my throat. This was undoubtedly my my favourite lunchbox. I would... No, sorry, that was yeah, a mistake. Yes, I didn't yes, even I mean think... to buzz. I actually didn't I, I, mean to buzz. I, I Repetition think... of favourite. Favourite's allowed, sorry. Yes, favourite is on the card. Yes, yes, it's I'm annoying, sorry. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So you get another point, Paul, and you still have the subject, and you've got 30 seconds with my favourite lunchbox starting now. It was illustrated at the top by pictures of Donald Duck and Torval and Dean, <laughs> and I was so pleased that I was able to eat the contents within. Sometimes my mother would slip a banana into my favourite lunchbox, and I would squeal with delight as I looked at the contents inside and realised it wasn't just 
Yes, Definitely yes. Definitely rep repeated contents inside. Paul, I don't think there was don't a repetition of uh, contents. I don't hear it anyway, so I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. Yes. You have 15 seconds 15 left seconds on this marvellous subject. On this subject of my favourite lunchbox, <laughs> starting now. I said to my parents after I'd left the educational establishment, what did you do with those old lunch boxes that I used to take there every day? She said to me, my glorious mummy, here you are, this is the one you prized above all others. I looked at it. Well, we've reached the final round, and as we reach that final round, it's very close indeed. Ed is in second place, just behind Paul. Lucy is <coughs> there, and Fred is, is, <laughs> is sitting, yeah. waiting for the independence of Scotland to come. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Lucy Porter, it's your go now. And the subject is, the last time I moved house. You have 60 seconds to tell us about the last time I moved house, Lucy Porter, starting now. The last time I moved house was from Croydon, which is a lovely little fishing village just to the <laughs> south of the, the fish. As it, oh, oh, fish. What do you think it is? Uh, I think it's deviation. I don't think Croydon is a lovely little fish finger village at all. <laughs> <laughs> Croydon does now call itself a town, so if you're questioning it whether it's a village... I no, I wasn't. I, mean, I think the fact is she said fish fing village. Right? Yeah, fish yes, village. So a deviation was. from uh, recognised English. I think I'm getting what you're saying, Fred. A translation will come through later, but I've got the gist. <laughs> <laughs> Winning over the local crowd yeah. there. And... <laughs> <laughs> when I heard you were replacing our usual chairman, I thought you'd make it to the end of the recording. <laughs> <laughs> but sadly, I was over optimistic. <laughs> Congratulations, Fred. A totally valid challenge, and you have 55 seconds with the subject, the last time I moved house, starting now. The last time I moved house was from Glasgow to a little village just outside that big city in the west of Scotland, where many of our audience members have travelled through from today to join us here in Edinburgh. I've been in this house for 21 years, and we had a five-year project on how to redecorate, recarpet, and refurbish the house, and we nearly finished it after 20 <laughs> The odd years, <laughs> which is slightly. <laughs> Paul Merton, what's your challenge? A hesitation, yeah. sadly. Mm. Certainly, there was a I hesitation. That... The subject is with you now, Paul Merton. The last time I moved house, you've got 29 seconds with it, starting now. I was playing Monopoly and I had a house on Park Lane and I realised I didn't want it to be there anymore, so I picked it up and moved it to the old Kent Road. I've moved house many times over the years, probably as many as about 13 or 14, but now where I am, I'm very happily settled and I don't imagine I'll be losing my ability to live in that particular property that I'm in now until some time has passed. The last time I moved house was a gloriously exciting experience. We had a party. Donald Duck, Torval and Dean, they turned up. <laughs> and I wonder how many times I can mention their names. Well done, Paul. Can I say, Ed, you have done very well indeed. It's been an interesting game. Uh, Fred, thank you very much for coming. Uh, <laughs> I, I am accustomed to my position. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy, you've done well, but not nearly as well as Ed, who I must say has done brilliantly, just a point or two behind this week's winner, who is Paul Merton. <laughs> So, we say thank you to these four feisty, fabulous players of the game, Paul Merton, Fred McCauley, Lucy Porter and Ed Byrne, and it only remains for me to salute Sarah Sharp, who blew the whistle and kept the score. We have to thank our producer, Richard Morris, uh, Ian Messiter, of course, who created the game, and most of all, this wonderful audience in the BBC's tented palazzo here at the Edinburgh Fringe. Uh, happily, Nicholas will be back uh, when the masseur has done her stuff. Uh, meanwhile, from me, Giles Miranda, thank you very much for tuning in and be with us again when we next take to the air to play Just a Minute. <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. As the minute waltz fades away, if my voice isn't the one you were expecting, this is because we live in uncertain times. There's a whiff of revolution in the air. No one in these islands knows quite what the future holds. The ravens are leaving the Tower of London and Nicholas Parsons isn't in the chair. But have no fear, there hasn't been a palace putsch 
We're in Edinburgh, and Nicholas has been out go-go dancing and has done his back in. <laughs> I'm Giles Brandreth. I'm here because I was by the telephone waiting for the call from Love Island. <laughs> I answered it, and here I am. We're at the Edinburgh Fringe, and here to play just a minute, and we've got four five-star superstars displaying their skill with words and language as they attempt to talk on a subject I give them for 60 seconds without hesitation, deviation, or repetition. Seated on my right, we have Paul Merton and Mark Watson, and seated on my left, we've got Kitty pritchard McLean and Fred McCauley. Please welcome all four of them. My colleague and carer, Sarah Sharp, is here to keep the scores and blow the whistle when the 60 seconds have elapsed. We're starting with you, Paul, and your first subject is putting up a tent. 60 seconds on putting up a tent, starting now. Well, it's a little easier now than it used to be in the old days. You can buy tents where you just basically take them out of the packet, throw them to the ground, and they turn into a tent. In the olden period of time, it used to involve Guy Ropes, who was one of the most fantastic country and western singers you could ever hope to see. And what would happen is it would be definitely pouring in rain as you struggled with this canvas to try and get it into a tent-like shape. Putting up a tent when I was nine years old, I was sent on a camping holiday by my parents. It was run by the Catholic Church, I think. I'm not quite sure why they were involved in such activities. But nevertheless, I was sent away for about a week and I put up this tent and it was... Oh, I've had enough of this. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Watson, what's your challenge? Oh, thank goodness. Uh, repetition of putting up a tent. No, that's the no, subject. Oh, repetition um, of putting up. It's an invalid challenge. I, I, I accept that my challenge is invalid. It is um, invalid. In that know? case, hesitation, because but you it's said I've late. had enough of I'm this. I'm sorry. It's oh, not... I can't have more than one challenge. No, no, you have to choose your challenge properly. Goodness me, this is why democracy doesn't work. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, you're, you're wanting a second vote, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid it's not allowed. So Paul continues with the challenge, the subject. It was, a, it was an incorrect challenge. He was clearly relishing it. He'd like to go on telling us about putting up tents. Please, Paul, continue for 24 seconds, starting now. There I was in the middle of the Sahara Desert. The sun was beating strongly down on the back of my neck and I had to put up a tent. I looked at the assembled tent pegs in front of me, various bits of string and other instruments were all around and I thought to myself, if I'm going to put up this tent, I need to be resolute. And then I suddenly had an inspiration out of nowhere. I... <laughs> You'll be surprised to know that Paul is in the lead. <laughs> <laughs> OK, it's your go now, Mark Watson. <laughs> You've got 60 seconds with the Shetland Islands. Mark, 60 seconds <laughs> in the Shetland Islands. It doesn't islands. all go well when people laugh even before you start it. <laughs> Good luck. 60 seconds with the Shetland Islands, starting now. The Shetland Islands were created on the fourth day when God accidentally dropped Scotland and a bit flaked off, and he said, I meant to do that. <laughs> Since then, they've always been there, but very few people have visited them as a destination. I myself have never been to this uh, archipelago because it is an awfully long way even from here. It's easy, if you're a southerner, to fall into the trap of thinking that uh, this country does not extend much further than Edinburgh, but in fact, the Shetland Islands are a good way north even of here. What sort of things then go on in this province <laughs> which uh, I've... Oh. <laughs> to be honest, I didn't think I'd get as far as that. I was surprised. Several people challenged at the same time, but the light went for Paul first. Paul, what was oh, your challenge? sadly, hesitation. It was right, hesitation. Exactly. Mark there to Paul, and you now have 25 seconds with the Shetland Islands starting now. I realised when I landed on the Shetland Islands, my first duty was to put up a tent. So I got <laughs> over the equipment. There were the guy ropes, who was a very popular country and western singer during the war, and I saw that the Shetland Islands rain was pouring down in front of me. I became wet and cold, but then I saw on the horizon swimming across the sea towards the Island, something that I had never believed that I would ever witness in my entire life. It was Nicholas Parsons astride a dolphin. <laughs> Paul was speaking when the whistle went, so he gets that extra point. And it's very nice to have Mark, Kitty, and Fred here, but we'd like them <laughs> to score as well. So on we move to the next round. Kitty, this is your turn. We've given you musical theatre. You, Kitty, have 60 seconds of musical theatre starting now. Musical theatre is one of my favourite art forms. If you're not familiar with it, it's sort of like opera, but for poor people. <laughs> so you go along to a magical theatre and you sit there and you watch incredible scenes. Uh... <laughs> oh, Mark, you challenged. 
hesitation. There was but hesitation. I, I don't feel good doing it because it's Kiri's first show. It's her first show, but she's she's confident. She doesn't need to be patronised. Um, <laughs> also, it might be the only point that I get, so yeah. I, I need to. Take, take your point, Mark, and you'd have, as well, 45 seconds on the subject of musical theatre, starting now. There is a long and glorious tradition of musical theatre in which people sing and dance and narrate stories using a, uh, an imaginative <laughs> question. <laughs> challenged by Fred McCauley. What's yeah, there was a hesitation. Yeah, it was, indeed. Yeah. Undoubtedly a hesitation. Point there for Fred, and you get the subject now. It's musical theatre, Fred. 37 seconds, starting now. I'm a fan of musical theatre. I've been fortunate enough to see many productions in London, Broadway, and on tour around the country in Edinburgh and Glasgow. The Producers is my favourite, without a doubt. Mel Brooks is nothing short of a genius. He combines comedy, lyrics, and beautiful songs, and I think that is the perfect combination for musical theatre. I've also seen Young Frankenstein, or Frankenstein, depending on how you wish to pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> Kitty, what's your challenge? It's the same word said differently, isn't it? It is. A very good challenge. Well done. Congratulations, Kitty. You get a point for that. And you have 13 seconds with the subject starting now. My favourite musical theatre performance is Book of Mormon. I absolutely love it. It's brilliant. It's hilarious. But in musical theatre world, there are disagreements about what constitutes a piece of musical theatre. Yes. Congratulations. Kitty is the newbie this week, but she's almost caught up with our leader, Paul Merton. Mark and Fred are doing well, <laughs> jointly at the bottom. <laughs> On we go now, Fred McCauley. The time I went to the cup final. 60 seconds starting now. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've You've been I've... challenged by Paul. <laughs> A repetition of silence. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been to the cup final. <laughs> Well, there you are. I'm afraid you're, you're going to be further discriminated against because it was a correct challenge. <laughs> the silence was deafening. Well done, Paul. You scored another point. I, did, I didn't know you could make things up. <laughs> have you not listened to me talking on this show? <laughs> I know. I mean, have you not put a tent up in the Sahara? <laughs> that bit is true. Isn't it? <laughs> well done, Paul. A correct challenge. You now have 57 seconds to talk about <laughs> the time I went to the cup final starting now. <laughs> and Mark Watson has challenged you. I've never been. I've never been to the cup final. <laughs> I didn't go with Fred. Do you remember that time you didn't go? Yeah. Oh, well, Mark, he's been to the cup final. Wait till you hear his stories. <laughs> I, I believe it was hesitation. It was <laughs> hesitation. And you can tell us any story you like, Mark. Do not worry. You've got 54 seconds to tell us about the time I went to the cup final starting now. Although it may not be very interesting to persons present, I have been to a cup final. I went to the Auto Windscreens Cup Final in 2015 between Bristol City, my football team of choice, and Stoke City. The... A challenge from Paul Merton. It's a shame they weren't playing somebody else that didn't have 16 years. <laughs> and what's especially chastening is actually it was Warsaw, but it I changed it. Changed it. <laughs> no. Okay, Paul. Repetition of City. And you have 43 seconds. 43 with seconds. It. I won't need the time the I went to the cup final starting now. <laughs> and Fred, surprisingly, has challenged. Why? There was a, an absolute hesitation there, I'm pretty convinced. I think you're right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolute hesitation. Uh, and I'm now going to allow you to hesitate uh, if you want to. The time I went to the cup final, Fred McCauley, 40 seconds starting now. It was 1967, <laughs> Per. A challenge there from Paul Deviation. Mark. He said he'd never been to the cup final. <laughs> <laughs> now he's telling us it was 1967. <laughs> Paul <laughs> comes in and listen to all this rubbish. <laughs> Paul gets a point for an ingenious challenge, but he doesn't get the subject back because, of course, you can fantasise. And so, well done, Fred. You can continue now for 38 seconds with the time I went to the cup <laughs> final starting now. Perth St Johnson versus Glasgow Celtic. It was the League Cup final and it was played at Hampden Park in Glasgow. I'd never been to that city before. <laughs> Mark, you challenged. I did, yes. I think Glasgow Celtic and Glasgow, as in the uh, place Hampton Park is, yes. was a repetition. Yes, yeah. a couple of cities, and it was Glasgow this time. You get a point, you have 30 seconds with the time I went to the cup final, starting now. Cup finals are generally contested in football every year, and of course a lot of people do not enjoy that sport, and so they find it hard to understand why it would be exciting to attend an event like this. But for somebody like me, who's a long-time fan of these kind of activities, it is very impressive to go to such a... Uh, 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 <laughs> And Kitty has challenged you. 
I don't know why I did this because I know nothing about football. Um, uh, hesitation. You did it mm. to score a point, and you have. Well done. Great. A correct challenge there. Well done, Kitty. 12 seconds with the time I went to the cup final starting now. The time I went to the cup final, I just accidentally knocked my head on a sink in the toilet because I was too drunk and imagined what happened at the cup final. And it was very similar to an episode of RuPaul's Drag Race. So I had a lovely time. <laughs> Kenny was speaking as the whistle went, which means she has moved into second place, a little bit behind Paul. Mark and Fred are together, jointly, holding hands at the bottom. <laughs> uh, but all can change as we move into the next round. It's your go now, Mark Watson. <laughs> Tweed. T W E D. Tweed is the subject. Thank you for spelling it, Giles. 60 <laughs> seconds with that, starting now. The tweed industry has largely been propped up by the number of detectives that there are around. People in that field enjoy wearing tweed because it seems to help them to reach conclusions about the murders and other cases which they have to investigate. Away from that, it's hard to say, really, who wears tweed garments in this day and age, but nonetheless, there is a sort of tendency among some people to employ this particular material as their garment... Oh, shit, I said garment. Oh. <laughs> And I could have been challenged even before that. People were generous there. Fred, what's your challenge? Uh, hesitation before he got to shit. Quite right. <laughs> well done, Fred. There was indeed a, a hesitation. And <laughs> means you've got the subject now for 34 seconds. You probably know a lot about this coming from these parts. Tweed. 34 not, seconds starting now. Not only is it a cloth, it's also a river, a famous one in Scotland for salmon, like the Tay and the Spey. The people... <laughs> Kitty has challenged you. I think there was a hesitation. There was yeah. a slight hesitation, but good enough. You get a point and you have the subject now, Kitty. 25 seconds with tweed. Tweed is one of my favourite itchy materials. <laughs> There's something about it rubbing against your thighs, chafing, giving you a rash that really makes you feel alive. <laughs> I, think that's... I was pausing for laughter, Mark. Yeah. Don't be so <laughs> pathetic. <laughs> You can feel the sense of excitement in the room. <laughs> yeah. Mark, Mark, what is your challenge? Well, I believe there was a hesitation, but I could have challenged for deviation because the word chafing hasn't been uttered on the network before. <laughs> but in fact, there was definitely a hesitation there. So you will get the point and you get the subject. 15 seconds with Tweed. Mark Watson starting now. And it is a fiddly business when your thighs are chafing together. There's nothing less comfortable, really, than looking down at that part of your body and thinking, well, this is absolutely awkward. What am I going to do? If only I'd worn a different material today. But, of course, I did not. The thing was... <laughs> Mark was speaking as the whistle went. He's gained an extra point, and he is just edging up towards Paul, who is still in first place, and uh, Fred is here, but um, Kitty is doing rather better. <laughs> Kitty, this is your turn now. The National Trust. The National Trust, you've got 60 seconds to tell us about that, starting now. The National Trust specialises in stately homes, scones and arguments on rainy days. <laughs> I am a National Trust member, which means I love going to visit very old buildings and then mainly... <laughs> Mark, you challenge for hesitation, but that I... That was actually a Welsh word, yes. so <laughs> I'm offended that it you It was would definitely do it. a hesitation, Mark. That was a correct challenge. You get a point. You have 45 seconds with the National Trust starting now. The National Trust is responsible for... Preser oh, dear. <laughs> Unfortunately, I said... <laughs> and Paul has challenged you. Uh, I, I, yes, it, it was hesitation, but perhaps <laughs> I should be generous and let Mark have another go. Given that Paul has played this game more often than any other human being and that you have only played it three times, that was gracious and generous of him. And, Mark, you have 42 seconds on the National Trust starting now. The National Trust is important because it is easy to neglect our uh, treasures, our castles, our palaces, our stately homes. And if we don't visit these things, then we lose part of the fabric of our collective history. And we, as a nation, are devalued by that. And that's why it is useful Hasn't to have... Hasn't been, like, four hesitations? Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> the trouble is, I do talk quite slowly at the best of times, so I'm not really suitable for this format. Yes, he, he challenged you with a little hesitation. You've challenged him with hesitations. Kerry, it's back with you now. You've got 25 seconds on the National Trust starting now. Something about having a National Trust membership makes you realise that you are better than other people. 
that little orange sticker that goes in the back of your car that says, I don't need to pay for this car park, but you muggles do, really gives you a sense of infer no, the other ones... Have... Paul, you challenge. Well, there's a bit of a hesitation, but also repetition of car. Yep, oh. absolutely. Get a point, Paul, and you get 11 seconds with this subject, the National Trust, starting now. Whenever I hear those magnificent words of National Trust, I can't help but conjure up in my mind the most vivid picture of a white horse galloping towards me. <laughs> <laughs> Paul was speaking as the whistle went and has consolidated his lead, but Mark is only just behind and Kitty is only just behind Mark. Fred is in the building. <laughs> and we're pleased to have him here because it's a subject for him now and I know he's going to be able to be quite eloquent about this. J.M. Barry. Oh. Tell us what you know about J.M. Barry in 60 seconds starting now. I do know a wee bit about J.M. Barry. He was born in Kirrymuir, which is a town in Angus, one of the counties of Scotland. He was also educated in Glasgow and Dumfries. Well known for writing many books, but perhaps the most significant of them all was Peter Pan, which included Wendy and the Lost Boys and Hook. Of course, now I have little doubt that at some point in his career, Giles Brandreth has been in pantomime as one of the lost persons. <laughs> Mark, what's there was a repetition of lost despite the ingenious <laughs> dodge. Uh, <laughs> there. there was a repetition. Is, is, is it true, isn't it, that he invented the name Wen Wendy? Y yeah, I believe so. Yes, yes he, it he, wasn't the name Wendy until he, until no, he composed yeah. it. So no, he, wrote it. He, he originated the name Wendy, and that was the part I wanted, but they gave me Tinkerbell. Uh, <laughs> so, Mark, that was a correct challenge. You get another point, and you get the subject for 32 seconds. J.M. Barry, starting now. J.M. Barry always ordered Brussels sprouts when he was eating dinner in a restaurant and he didn't ever eat it. And uh, uh, people often asked him, why do you do this, Dan? And he said... Uh, because, uh, oh, no, 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 wait, 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 he's, he's coming to the punchline. It's a good bit of trivia, okay. but I have already oh, repeated on. myself numerous times. OK, well, tell us. Uh, he said, the words are just so lovely to say. Oh, really? Oh. He, he enjoyed the phrase so much that he uh, routinely ordered it, even though he had no intention of actually consuming... I don't know, I don't know if I'm playing or not anymore. We'd hurt, no, you're not. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, <laughs> yes, I, is that, you've heard that you were nodding, so that's... that's yeah, no, I was true. just encouraging you. I think it's a load of old rubbish. Yeah, it probably is. <laughs> yeah. Fred, challenge. What was your challenge? Hesitation. There yep. was a hesitation, yeah. Fred. Congratulations. And I'm sorry I did, Mark, uh, because as a comedian, I should know when somebody's building up to a punchline. And I, <laughs> I think no. you should give Mark... Several in all fairness, points. I have hesitated for more than ten seconds. Can I say, I think you're right. We should give Mark a bonus for that yep. interesting incidental information about J.M. Barry. So, Fred McCauley, you've got J.M. Barry for 23 seconds, starting now. Mr. Barry, it's yourself. Would you be liking broccoli, cauliflower, peas or carrots? Neither! I'm having Brussels sprouts for my friend Wendy here, whose name I just made up. What is your name, actually, <laughs> anyway, lass? There's been a challenge from Paul Mel. Oh, sadly, repetition of name. Yep. Oh, well name done. Wendy, well spotted, name? Paul. You get a bonus for that, and you have 12 seconds with J.M. Barry starting now. J.M. Barry also wrote a play called The Admirable Crichton that was filmed on a couple of occasions, starring Kenneth Moore, is particularly the well-known version. He was an extraordinary author who created characters that live in the memory forever. <laughs> Paul Merton. Genesis is your subject now. You've got 60 seconds to tell us what you like about Genesis starting now. Well, I don't like anything about Genesis. I thought they were a really boring rock band from the 1970s. Some of the individual members, Phil Collins and some other people, left and joined at simultaneous times. I don't really care about Genesis. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank Mark, you. Mark, why good, challenging? Good, good. Um, I don't know whether you'd call that a deviation or a hesitation, really. Both. But, uh, there's, there's sort of noticeable lack of interest in the subject. Yeah, anyway. absolutely <laughs> both. I, I lost the will to live. <laughs> I'd call that a hesitation. Yeah, absolutely. And I give you a point for correct interruption. Absolutely. And you have 50 seconds, Mark, oh. with the subject of Genesis starting now. Peter Gabriel from the band Genesis shares a birthday with me. That day is February the 13th, which means that both of us are in the Aquarius star sign. Uh, he went on to have quite an interesting career after being a member of that band, as, of course, did the drummer who became a singer, uh, Philip, <laughs> Co <laughs> Philip Colino. Paul, <laughs> your challenge? 
Uh, yes, it was hesitation, sadly. A correct challenge. And, Paul, you've got 32 seconds with Genesis again, starting now. Mike Rutherford was another member of Genesis, and maybe somebody called Steve Cropper, I think I've got that right, or maybe it's wrong. They were so... And the challenge comes from Mark. A repetition of the word maybe, and also Paul's continuing and palpable reluctance to discuss the subject. Yes. <laughs> repetition of the word maybe is what gets you the point, and you have 25 seconds now with Genesis. Take it away, Mark. Mike Rutherford went on to be in a band called Michael and the Mechanics, who had a very uh, big hit. And you've been challenged by Paul. <laughs> it was Mike and the Mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard for me to say that in the circumstances. Yeah. Technically, it, it was... Technically uh, a deviation, yeah. but given we're playing just a minute, it was a legitimate one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, we're not giving that to Paul. We're giving you a bonus... Mark, and we're giving you 18 more seconds with Genesis starting now. <laughs> that song, uh, The Living Years, was all about the need to understand and empathise with our loved ones while we are alive, rather than waiting and having regrets after their natural lifespan has expired. It was an enormously popular song in 1989, and in that same year, my grandfather passed away. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, after that final tour de force, you will be excited to know that you are the equal leader with Paul Merton. Mark Watson, congratulations. It's a needle match, and it's your big moment, Mark, because you could move into the lead now with your subject, which is busking. You've got 60 seconds with that, Mark Watson, starting now. The now internationally renowned musician Ed Sheeran began as a busker. All he did was to play the songs of other people and hope that passers-by would give him money in order to replicate those musical compositions and gradually he became more and more accomplished and... Oh, you've been challenged by Paul? Well, it is more and more. It is more and more and that is a repetition. It's a valid challenge. You get a point, you move back into the lead, Paul, and you have... 45 seconds with busking starting now. As I took out my banjo and gave it a final polish with a chamois leather, <laughs> I looked at the crowd outside the Odeon cinema and I thought to myself, I have to entertain this mob. I started playing songs from the Genesis back catalogue <laughs> and how the people danced with joy as they heard the familiar tunes from their childhood. As I busked away, I could see that people were beginning to embrace. A challenge there from Mark Watts. Uh, <laughs> repetition of people. Yes. Yes. Uh, I think. Well done, Mark. Absolutely. You're doing well. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, <laughs> you've now got 23 seconds with busking starting now. Paul Merson's famous busking uh, performance in the Sahara is one of the. Uh, <laughs> Paul, you've challenged. Yes, hesitation. He did hesitate. Get a point for that. You've moved back into the lead, Paul. You have 17 seconds with busking starting now. I started plucking the strings. I could see that individuals in front of me were so moved by the musicality emanating from my fingertips, they couldn't help but embrace and look at each other straight in the eye and say, this is what I call living. I have never felt like this, ever! <laughs> so, Paul there was speaking when the whistle went. He gets another point, which means he is back in the lead. So anything can happen in this next and final round. Fred, this is your moment. You've got an Englishman, an Irishman, and a Scotsman. That's the subject. On the card, an Englishman, an Irishman, a Scotsman. You've got 60 seconds with them starting now. There are many ways of starting a joke. An Englishman, an Irishman, and a Scotsman is a traditional way, and I can tell you for... Mark, you challenge. Repetition, but actually it's ways and then way. I don't know if that counts. Or yeah. It doesn't count. No. So that was a false challenge. Uh, Does that mean that we get another point? It... <laughs> it means that Fred gets another point. Congratulations, Fred. And you now have 51 seconds left with an Englishman, an Irishman, a Scotsman starting now. In 31 years of stand-up comedy, I have never started a gag with an Englishman, an Irishman and a Scotsman. Although I realise that there are many ways that one could introduce all these three characters into a joke which might work in a situation like this with these people here in Edinburgh who probably don't want to hear anything about the Englishman or the Irishman. So three Scots went into a pub. What a great night they had. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> steaming. <laughs> And there's been a challenge from Paul. Well, it, it was hesitation, but also he's deviated from the subject now. We've got three Scotsmen, not an Englishman, <laughs> no, and a Scotsman. 
You get your point, Paul. Congratulations. And you have 24 seconds with an Englishman, an Irishman, a Scotsman, starting now. An Englishman, an Irishman and a Scotsman hire a rowing boat for the day. They row out to the middle of the lake and they start catching fish. And the Scotsman says, this is a very good place. We must remember to come back here tomorrow. And the Irishman says, I'll just put a chalk sign on the side of the boat. And that essentially... There's been a challenge from Mark. I think boat was repeated. Yes, Ooh, must have been. Yes. Boat was repeated. Yes. Well yes. Done. Congratulations, yes. Mark. <laughs> At a key moment in the game, mm. I have to tell you, Mark, I'll share this with you, you are just one point behind Paul, oh. who is our leader. Well done, This us. is the only the third time you have played this. <laughs> Paul has played this game many hundreds of times. To use the vernacular, you are turbocharged. And are you ready? <laughs> Yes, I am, Charles. <laughs> Are you ready for this moment of glory? You have got eight seconds with an Englishman, an Irishman, a Scotsman, starting now. The Scotsman says, well, this is a difficult situation and no mistake. We have to take this boat back to the higher place. Uh, but you've the thing been is... challenged by Fred McCauley. Oh, it's an incorrect challenge. Mark gets a point. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot believe that happened. I'm so sorry. I saw a copy of a book called Gamesmanship sticking out of Fred McCauley's pocket as he arrived, but it was, under the rules of just a minute, it was a challenge. He acknowledged it was a false challenge, so indeed Mark does get a point. <laughs> which means it's very close indeed. Well, this all feels perfectly ethical. <laughs> this actually is chiming in with the national mood, isn't it? <laughs> We're going to be neck and neck. We're going to have to have a second of referendum or a general election to sort this one out. This is very close. You've only got one second, Mark. <laughs> Let me remind you what the subject is. It's an Englishman, an Irishman, a Scotsman. One second, starting now. The Irishman. Congratulations. One point. <laughs> Let me give you the final score, ladies and gentlemen. Kitty and Fred, between them, have done very well. <laughs> in second place, we have Paul Merton. Beating him by one point is Mark Watson. Congratulations, Mark. Well done. That's it, so we say thank you to this week's players of the game, Paul Merton, Mark Watson, Kitty Pritchard McLean, and Fred McCauley. Thank you to Sarah Sharp for giving the score. Thank you to Richard Morris, our producer, and to Ian Messito, who created the game. But most of all, our thanks to our very special audience here in the BBC's mobile amphitheatre at the Edinburgh Fringe. From me, Giles Brandreth, and all of us here in Edinburgh, thank you for tuning in and be with us next time when we come to the air to play Just a Minute. <laughs> <laughs>